Um, I'm um, Lois Stanford. I'm the moderator for this. I'm just going to kind of introduce um, the, the kind of top. Okay, I will. I will. I, I don't want to use the mic. So I will project my voice. So if anybody can't hear me, I'm, I teach, and I'm used to teaching to like 50, 100 students. So if anybody can't hear me in the back of the room, just like flag, flag me down. Um, and this topic is, we're focused talking about um, farming, indigenous farming and strategies, and this is particularly relevant, you know, in the current situation of the drought where we've seen record temperatures during the summer, declining crop yields, and st extensive drought throughout the region, despite the really good monsoon season that we just had. Um, and this has major consequences for farming in terms of the challenges that are posed by climate change and the impact in climatic variability. Um, evolutionary principles teach us that long-term adaptation and survival is grounded in diversity, biological diversity, ecological diversity, cultural diversity. That's what increases the flexibility and enhances resilience in situations of environmental change. So we really need to rethink our approach to farming. There's no single crop practice, there's no drought resistant variety that's going to save farming in arid conditions. Instead, we really need to develop a more sophisticated, complex view of farming, one where we study, we appreciate, we learn from diverse practices about farming, particularly the kind of farming, indigenous farming, that operates in close relationship with specific ecological conditions. So the cases that we have here today provide really important lessons um, and as well they provide insights and ideas into practices that can address some of the current crises that we face. So first we have Mart Matt Barber, um, manager from the Hemis historic site um, speaking about an archaeological situation. Okay. Uh, how many of you been along high uh, driven highway four before? Show of hands. It should be almost everybody in here. If you haven't been along Highway 4, please drive along Highway 4 and come visit us at Jemez Historic Site sometime in the future. Um, but as you probably realize, as you're driving along Highway 4 and going through the Jemez Springs area, it's a really mountainous area. Um, it's not an area you would necessarily expect agriculture to be a big part of the subsistence diet. Um, yet it was. Almost all of the mesa tops above Hamas Springs were farmed traditionally. Some of the earliest evidence of corn in the American Southwest comes from the Hamas Springs area. And one Spanish explorer in 1583 even estimated that there was a population of about 30,000 people living in the Hamas Mountains, which were supported primarily by corn or maize agriculture. Uh, Pueblo peoples in general have always been known for being great farmers, but the case in Jemez is really even atypical of Pueblo peoples in general. Uh, to, to make it, uh, the, the environment of Jemez Pueblo, or the environment of the Jemez Mountains is very, very unique overall. And what you had there was a local adaptation to, uh, to farming, which was unique. Um, it focused primarily on the fact that while you have a lot of um, perennial streams there, streams that run year round, the valleys are really narrow. You can't do traditional Pueblo cultural practices. So if you, if you look at the modern day Pueblo world, most of the Pueblos you see today are located along the Rio Grande and used primarily flood water agriculture. The, the river flooded every year before we dammed it up. That would rejuvenate the soils and allow people to plant their crops. You could do small ditches off those and irrigate your fields. Uh, the valleys in the Jemez Springs area and the Jemez Mountains in general are very narrow. So while you have lots of different rivers, including the Viacitos, the Jemez, the Guadalupe River, those canyons themselves are, are mostly slot canyons. In fact, in the case of the Guadalupe, um, the Guadalupe Creek, I mean, you're talking about something that's less than 100 feet across. Uh, you can't really farm down in those valleys. Um, also, because they are so narrow, they're actually prone to catastrophic flooding which pretty much when it rains, it pours, and when it pours, it floods. Uh, we even see this today. If you drive on Highway 4 right after a rain shower, what you're going to see is dirt and debris all over the roads because pretty much you're dealing with large volumes of water very quickly through the area. Those are really disruptive for, for growing um, corn and growing other crops. 
So what the Jemez did is they had a unique perspective on it, which was to grow high above them, above those creeks themselves. So when you look at the Mesa tops, whether it be Virgin Mesa, Holiday Mesa, and no, it's not important that you remember the names of any of these places, these flat-lying mesas, they put their fields up there. The Jemez Mountains, even though no place in the Southwest is gifted with an abundance of rain, the Jemez Mountains actually gets enough rain or adequate rain to do dry farming, which is simply, as we learned about a little bit in the past talks over at uh, MOIFA, or the Folk Art uh, Museum, dry farming is the use of rainfall pretty much to feed your fields. And that's exactly what the Jemez did. The, the, the greatest amount of flat land in the Jemez Mountains is on top of the mesa tops. But these mesa tops also conveyed a number of other advantages. Um, primarily the fact that even though the mesa tops are at a higher altitude, um, as you may know from ballooning, most likely in New Mexico, hot air rises and cold air sinks. So even though these mesa tops are at a higher elevation, they actually have a more steady environment uh, for growing crops. The, the spikes of cold in the mountains that you get in the late spring and early fall, the, the greatest temperature variations are in the valleys. These low-lying mesas do very well to kind of moderate that temperature. So while the temperature may never get as high, it doesn't get as low during the growing season. Um, they are also, if, if you notice it, where they're farming in the Jemez Mountains, it's not necessarily they farm any old mesa. The mesa tops that they chose to farm and where the greatest concentration of people were in the Jemez Mountains was along the southwest portion of that mountain range where those mesas faced south, which allowed for the most solar gain and allowed for the greatest um, kind of uh, crop production or, or perf best environment for agriculture in the mountains. They also chose to farm in a way that we don't think of today as being necessarily normal. The, the mountains are forested. And from all environmental reconstructions, they didn't necessarily deforest the mountains. Instead, they farmed amongst the trees, uh, which is slightly different. I mean, we look at the Jemez Mountains today, the kind of environment you see in the Jemez Mountains today is really bad, primarily as a result of logging in the 20th century and fire suppression. Um, as, we've as we logged all the old wood out of the mountains, the big gigantic ponderosas that once existed there and didn't allow fires to naturally occur. What you have is nowadays a, a dogwood conifer setting, which is lots of little trees growing right next to each other. Uh, some environmental reconstructionists have estimated that, only, it, that traditionally in the prehistoric era, there was only about 20 trees per acre. And these would have been the big, big ponderosas that you sometimes see occasionally nowadays in the Hamaz Mountains and you see in other uh, more um, natural forest, uh, which allows you a larger growing area. So rather than um, producing the labor necessary to cut these trees down, they would actually grow in between them, which served two purposes. The trees actually, st the root systems of the trees actually stabilized the soil, which allowed for less uh, runoff of the nutritional soil, but also conferred, they, they, to make this work, they had to kind of plant a, a very dispersed pattern. So instead of the intense fields you see along the river today, it was growing in a much more um, dispersed setting. And as a result, most of Hamaz settlement, while they built villages in the mountains, in fact, Hamaz historic site preserves the ruins of Gisa Watoa, uh, an ancestral village, uh, most of the occupation, at least seasonally, was in field houses. And while all Pueblo peoples uh, built field houses, the Pueblo peoples of Jemez really built them as like a fine art. There's thousands upon thousands of field houses just on Virgin Mesa alone. Uh, these represent the small little farming hamlets that they would live in while they, they farmed and worked their fields. Um, even when Spanish, uh, the Spanish came and the plow came in, in 1598, or I guess slightly earlier if you want to look at Coronado's expedition, uh, very little changed amongst the Jemez farming practices. Uh, they didn't move into the valleys as a result of these new productions. In fact, while they integrated new crops and, of course, domesticated animals into their diet, they still maintained um, their traditional farming practices. And uh, their traditional farming practices actually worked really great. Uh, the reason we don't see farming on Virgin Mesa today is a product of European policy, which is the fact that the Jemez revolted in 1680 and then re-revolted in 1696. These revolts against uh, Spanish control um, 
were viewed as a viewed as a control issue, for lack of a better word. And the Spanish wanted to control the population. Because Jemez lived on these high ridges, it was harder to control them. Uh, their sites were incredibly defensible. And as a result, they forced the Jemez to stop those farming practices and resettle in the valley where Jemez Pueblo is today, at the place of Walatoa, or village in the valley. Um, the Jemez themselves never really abandoned the mountains. In fact, ancestral claims today would suggest that they would claim the Valles Caldera and most of the Santa Fe National Forest as their ancestral homelands. And, and from an archaeological perspective, that's absolutely right. In addition to the farming itself, they would have gathered um, uh, wild plant resources as well as hunted in those areas that did not sustain farming. Um, but I think the Jemez example uh, works, as a real, works as a very good example in the sense that we can look at the fact that in this case, the Jemez people read the environment in which they were living. They chose specifically places to farm that we would not necessarily think of today, but it was in a sense of reading uh, what the environment told them about what areas could sustain agriculture and how they could sustain agriculture. Uh, this has applications for as we're, we're dealing with the fact that uh, our, our own, you know, water climate change, uh, water issues throughout the American Southwest, and um, global subsistence as a whole for feeding the world that we live in. Um, an area today that we don't think of as being an agricultural uh, breadbasket can be an agricultural breadbasket if you listen to the right people and you read the environment in which you have or given. And that's pretty much my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let everybody kind of talk about the cases, and then we'll open it up to um, discussion. And thanks for keeping it so short. Um, next, um, we have Richard Ford, um, professor of anthropology and ethnobotanist, who's worked for years on the ethnohistory of maize production. Good morning. Thank you for coming. I want you to take away two messages this morning. The first one is that the Pueblo Indians were wonderful hydrologic engineers. And I'm going to talk about that in terms of water conservation and the high use, efficient use of water through their pre-contact technology. The second thing is feeding back on Dr. Frank's uh, talk this morning, which was a wonderful keynote for all of us, and that has to do with the term that she used, tech, traditional ecological knowledge. And this has to do with the techniques that were used to manage the plants that were used in a variety <coughs> of ways by the pre-contact Pueblo Indians. The first one in terms of their hydrologic engineering, we see that they took advantage of both the topography as well as the water in its dispersal through precipitation in the uh, northern part of New Mexico. Now, the technique that they used that was most efficient for water dispersal and distribution was the development of a technique that is known as mulch, lithic mulch agriculture. And this is where they were digging gravel from the edges of the mesas and then distributing this over the field areas where they were going to plant. This would be to a depth of about 10 centimeters of gravel, and that forms a mulch that holds the water that is from the precipitation that falls on this mulch. It goes through, but the stones do two things. First of all, it breaks the surface evaporation, so it holds the water longer. And this was an efficient way 
of maintaining water for their crops for a longer period of time than if they were just doing surface area planting. The second thing is, and this comes back to what Matt was talking about, and that is the stone holds the heat. So at the beginning of your growing season, when you just put in your maize and following that your other crops, or at the end of the growing season, just before they're about to harvest their corn, they can sometimes have what we might have this afternoon, and that is periods of temperature drops that in the evening can bring early frosts. What happens? The stone holds the heat, and it keeps from having frost hurt your crops. So they are not only dealing with water, but they're also dealing with how can they change the environmental factors that will be disastrous for their food supply. They did it with this gravel. So we find all over northern New Mexico these grids of gravel that are found from just north of Taos all the way down south of Interstate 40. The next thing, though, in terms of water was that they developed a series of spreaders. And this is where they would have a hillside. And to keep the water from flowing through too fast, and possibly even eroding their farmland, they built small walls of stone that would stop the water, ease it through the rocks, and let it then go across their growing areas. So that they had this as a way of preserving both the soil as well as using the water in an efficient manner. What did they do in terms of arroyos? Well, here's another ingenious thing. They took the arroyos, and we can see it mathematically, that they would put small check dams across the arroyos that would stop the flow of water, the water that was carrying sediment in solution would then drop the sediment and we end up having the buildup behind these small check dams of a new, very fertile soil that they could plant in. And so you go down these arroyos and you'll have one step after another where they have developed a new planting area as a result of their engineering. The big arroyos that come out of the mountains they would put large check dams across these so that they could use the whole floodplain as a way of farming. So that we have this variety of landscape modification for the benefit of fields where they would be raising their crops. Now, here comes the surprise. In northern New Mexico, in these fields, we find corn, beans, squash, just as we would expect. But we also, in looking at the pollen, we can see that there are a number of plants that I call ruderals. These, some people would call weeds but I don't like that term because a weed is a plant that's growing out of place. And for the Pueblo people, these are not weeds. These are things that grow on the back of Mother Earth that are meant for us. And so you'll get your quinopods, your, your amaranthus, you will get your purslane that was mentioned. All of this is growing in these grids and it's also growing 
in our new planting areas behind the dams in the arroyos. But there's even more. In northern New Mexico, one of the major crops was cotton. And another symposium going on right now, Glenna Dean is the pyelonologist who first found and confirmed that cotton was raised extensively in these grid fields in northern New Mexico. The cotton then, of course, is a textile that could be used. It was an important ceremonial plant to have. The seeds are very oily, and it's one of the things that they used on the bua stones. That is your peaky bread stones. That was one of the oils that they used. They used that, and they used the seeds that came from squash uh, to get the oil. And they, they smeared a paste of this over the stone, and it gave the oil just like she talked about this morning. So that things are interacting. This is part of our tech. How did they use these things? But even more than that, the plants that we find on this landscape are all an anthropogenic ecosystem. The people totally controlled the plants that were growing in their field areas and in the stream areas so that these would be managed by the people. And this included your perennial plants, as was mentioned this morning, and Dodie, who's here, talked about them. They managed their uh, yuccas, both uh, angustifolia, the narrow leaf, as well as the banana yucca. These were managed for the purposes of a whole variety of useful things and food. And under the circumstances, the, the landscape that the Spanish came into is not the landscape we see today. The reason for that is the managers, part of our second message, the managers of that landscape have been removed. And the Pueblo people are not managing the size landscape, just like Dr. Frank said this morning, that they once controlled. So when we look back, we see that the landscape was an anthropogenic landscape that was controlled by Pueblo people. The water was distributed by the Pueblo people through their technology, the yields of the land are much higher in the past than they are today because of the plants that were being managed by the Pueblo people. And that's it. <laughs> um, our next presentation is by Terrell Du Johnson, the co-founder of the Toono O'odam Community Action, which is an organization that operates farms and sells Native American foods. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm from Terrell Lee Johnson. I'm from the Autumn. Uh, I am from the village of Gaulic, and uh, my grandmother and grandfather, Alex and Catherine Poncho, and my mother uh, is uh, Betty Ann Poncho, my father is Roger Johnson. Um, and, you know, this organization that we started almost 20 years ago was really based on really trying to bring back a lot of the things that I felt we were losing. Um, going, going, looking back at traditional food-wise, you know, I grew up with my grandparents and was very fortunate because my grandfather was a medicine man and my mother, my grandmother was a herbalist. And so, um, and they grew. They came from a farming village and they... Uh, pretty much listening from stories from my mother um, grew all their food and provided for their family and their village um, and so the idea of tasting the foods growing up I always had them at special occasions because 
over the years, you know, they they weren't farming as much. You know, uh, statistically, more than 50, 70 years ago, um, on the Thana Autumn Reservation, about a million, 5.5, 1.5 million pounds of tepary beans was grown every year. Um, coming back into the 70s and the 80s, you couldn't even get 100 pounds. So, you know, and it drastically dropped um, because of the environmental conditions, but also just because of what was going on. And those had talked about it, you know, with the commodity foods, with boarding schools, with the world wars, you know, things like that. And so it drastic, all those just had a big play in um, our food system um, on the reservation, but I think also in the other native communities as well. Um, so the idea was again to really look back at how they were farming and how to keep the, the, the foods alive, um, the cultivated foods. Uh, we're in the desert, so we're very low. We're not in the high area, but you know, with the same methods that um, people like in Hopi would use, you know, they rely heavily on the snow that they get for winter to really soak up the soil, the sand, and so that it um, is ready for um, the crops to be um, put in and grown. Um, for us, we rely on the floodwaters from the monsoon season, which is a very short window, um, maybe three, three months, um, which is currently happening right now. Um, a lot of the crops that we do grow, traditional crops, tepary beans, uh, squash, melon, corns, things like that, have adapted to the desert. Um, Lois had talked about the tepary beans, you know, um, it doesn't require a lot of water. You know, the more stress you put on it, so the less water that you, you, you um, give it, you know, the more it will produce because, again, it's telling the, the plant that, oh, I'm not getting any water, I need to produce so I can, you know, live longer. And, and, and spread my seed all over. <laughs> so, you know, things like that. Um, we have corn that matures from seeds to, to the corn in 60 days. So, you know, things like that um, is what we, our ancestors, my grandparents had grown. Um, and it really was an important, I thought, at the time, you know, it was, an, it was a, a project. You know, I didn't think it was going to be something that was going to last this long and evolve to what we now have is a farm. Uh, 108 acre farm. Um, we do have another farm which is a lot smaller and we use it as a classroom. Um, I think it's about 20 acres. Um, and then we also have a restaurant where we solely really focus on Thana Autumn foods and the foods that we do get through our farming but also um, through um, harvesting um, wild foods. And so with that idea starting up this organization, you know, I didn't really imagine it to get in this big and, um, you know, really trying to um, inspire other communities around the country to do the same thing. Uh, we really uh, try to focus a lot on specifically Don Autumn foods. Um, in that, in doing that, it really did... Uh, open a lot of opportunities for the community as a whole. Um, I think Roxanne had touched on that, you know, and that wasn't just the foods. It's um, the stories that go behind the foods. It's the community that was built to keep these foods alive. Uh, with the foods, you know, I always tell people, you know, you're not just looking at a bean when I show them beans. You know, you're looking at the entire Thanatham culture there. You know, because when we plant, we have to bless um, the seeds. We had to bless and purify the ground. We plant the seeds, and then there's songs um, that you sing to nurture the seeds as it's growing, you know, maintaining the land, um, you know, and that's just for the ground and the seeds, but then we also have to sing for the rain. So we have ceremonies that we sing for the rain to come in and, and water the plants, um, not only to water the plants, but also to help the desert grow as well. Uh, so that uh, the animals could eat, so that we can hunt the animals and eat. So uh, a lot of that does come into play, and it was very important to revitalize a whole um, culture. And uh, it's been very successful. We're still going on. In fact, we, um, to the point of where we're 
currently trying to get all the traditional foods that we serve and that we harvest um, into the schools on the reservation. And so we actually, after eight years of really trying to push that idea, have finally have made an impact and actually are now working with schools on the reservation where we are every day serving some sort of traditional Donna Autumn food to the, the students. And um, we are working with IHS hospitals to get some of the foods into their um, lunch programs. We're working with elderly programs on the reservation to get the foods out there. Um, we're also working with colleges and we're also working with uh, community members to start gardening. Um, on the reservation, pretty much all the the land out there in different villages in different areas was cultivated and um, was farmland. But again, because of what had happened, as I mentioned earlier, with the wars, with the BIA schools, with um, commodities, things like that, everything came, um, it, it just became more of a convenience to wait for the commodity truck to come and unload all the food. You know, it was a lot easier to, to sit at a desk and earn money so you can just go to the store and buy your foods there. So, you know, and a lot of times, a lot of the people gotten used to that. And that's where I think all the problems with the health issues that hit Native communities around the country had come from. And so with the idea of revitalizing the, the farm, the farming, um, making the crops and the foods available really made an impact in our community for over 20 years that our program had existed. And so, and now, you know, it's, it's amazing and I don't see any end to it at the moment. So I'm really excited and very happy that I, I, the ideas that we had are benefiting the nation, our nation, the Thon Alton nation as a whole, uh, to the point where we are looking to expand and inspire other communities around the country to to look at their traditional um, foods and really try to make an effort to um, restore them because not only are you doing that you're you're restoring your health you're restoring your community you're restoring your traditions um, and um, basically restoring your health and keeping people literally alive Roxanne had mentioned that, you know, with the three-month uh, experiment that they had, just the health benefits within that three months of eating their traditional foods had made on them. Um, you know, because Native communities around the country are small, so um, they are highlighted, a few, a few of them are highlighted and looked at. Um, there was a, a statistic years ago where our tribe and our sister tribe, the Pima, Akuna Altham were the largest minority group in the entire world with type 2 diabetes. Kids as young as four years old were getting um, diabetes. Uh, and within this time range of really looking back at traditional foods and making it available for them, we are starting to see a difference. Um, it wasn't as intense as what um, Roxanne had done, but adding some kind of traditional foods in your diet on a daily basis or even on a weekly basis had made a significant impact and change on, on people that had health problems. Um, but so, you know, that's what we're doing. Uh, and with the farming, you know, we actually use a method called flood-based farming where we actually rely, again, on the monsoon rains to supply the entire water um, um, needed for our crops. Uh, monsoons hit, um, it comes from the mountains, and so the mountains then would start, um, the water would start going into little washes that will get bigger and bigger, so when it gets to the valley, it just dumps all the settlement that it picked up along the way that is full of nutrients and, um, you know, um, vitamins for the crops there. So uh, it really helped grow, uh, help grow our crops. Um, and maintaining and crop rotation, uh, you know, really, again, was something that we had to learn through our elders. We, it, was something, it wasn't anything that we got through books or anything like that. It was a matter of actually going um, to uh, individual elders um, at the time that were still um, growing 
but or were just still alive and that knew all this knowledge. My brother Nolan Johnson, who was a farmer who we actually hired to um, clear land that we actually um, obtained by our family and or uh, given permission to bring back a lot of the, the, the farmland there in that particular area. Uh, and my uh, grandmother, who was alive at the time, actually walked with us through an overgrown Palo Verde tree and mesquite tree um, farm area, where she pointed out this is where we had um, um, this certain um, plant or crops growing, or this is where we you know, would um, thrash or clean the corn, things like that. So uh, with her um, knowledge and her pointing out specific areas, we actually brought back, brought back the farm, farming in that particular area. And, um, you know, my brother who took on the role as farm manager actually went to my uncles and to other el elders in different villages to really get ideas and get um, the knowledge that otherwise would not have been um, preserved. And so now we are actually teaching community members and teaching young people um, how to farm, how to work the land, how to live off the land. And so we are, I think we've been pretty successful in that. And our priority right now is to really make sure that um, there is access to a lot of the traditional foods that we grow. You know, because when you talk about cultural revitalization through the foods, you have to have a supply. You know, you can talk all you want and make sure that you have the stuff, but when you think about it, you have to look back and say, well, how are we going to get the foods? How are we going to um, have people learn how to process the foods and cook the foods? So with that idea, a whole lot of other doors have opened up and a whole lot of other jobs have popped up because now we have to look at not only having traditional foods, but adding on what Roxanne had mentioned, the other elements into you know, the chilies and the flavors of the different foods to make it appealing. Um, right now, um, we are currently working with several chefs around the country um, that come to our little cafe and add in their little, the little um, personalities and their little, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, their, their tricks into making foods um, delicious. You know, we work with chefs. Uh, we, uh, again, are trying to make sure that these foods are appealing and um, available. So with that, you know, we had to actually start teaching young kids how to cook because a lot of people don't cook no more. You know, a lot of people just go, uh, it's a lot of heat and serve in the schools, and we all know that. So, you know, and we actually are teaching people how to hold knives and how to cut squash, how to cut melons, how to shuck corn, how to roast corn, you know, how to grind corn, things like that. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of this cultural revitalization through the farming and through the, the foods that we are working on. And again, we've been very successful. And to read about it, we actually have this magazine called Native Foodways. And it highlights a lot of Native communities around the country on what other communities are doing to revitalize and to bring back the farming to bring back a lot of the traditional foods in their communities and in their area, but also to bring back the health that a lot of Native communities all over the country have lost. So that's what I do. <laughs> okay, and our final presentation, our final case, is presented by Roxanne Swenzel from Santa Clara Pueblo, who is the founder of the Flowering Tree Permaculture Institute. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you if those that have, were here this morning I spoke about the food diet that we were part of. Um, besides the food thing, I just want to mention, uh, go on very much about this, but the permaculture aspect of how it all started um, was all about, for me specifically, about saving our traditional crops. And I, I picked Richard Ford's brain a lot here. <laughs> Everybody has because he's got extensive knowledge on our traditional methods of farming. And so over the last 30 years, I've actually been practicing those older methods of farming. 
and along with saving the seeds of our crops and recently trying to um, get it back into our lifestyle so that we're using it. It's one thing to learn it and, and have it and have these seed banks and stuff, but if they're not being used, what's the point? So, you know, the diet project was part of convincing my tr particular tribe and my particular family that these products are good for us and, and to, you know, experience it firsthand so that they want to eat these crops and by wanting to eat these crops, it promotes farming again. <laughs> and it promotes keeping those plants alive then. And you know, one thing leads to the next, as Jerome was saying. Um, it's a whole picture, it's not just one piece of it. You start to like, this. yesterday I had a table of women and grandchildren around the table. We were cleaning cotton seed we had just grown. And um, if you ever cleaned our you know, cotton, it takes a while. So we were talking about cotton gins. <laughs> like, how amazing it would be to have a cotton gin. <laughs> As we're sitting there, it was an incredible moment of you know, community to be cleaning seed. And I never heard that you, we could use the seed for piki stones, the boa stones. So I'm like going, all oh, right, thank you for that piece of information. <laughs> um, so uh, all, all of these fit together. It's like um, this amazing weaving of diversity. and. And it's not just with, um, you know, people think farming is a field where you have these rows of, of crops and, or one crop, corn over here and something else over here. But the thing that I understand that the Pueblo people um, did to survive for thousands of years in this high desert climate was they, they diversified. They put so many little pieces together so that it wasn't just one monocrop thinking of any sort. So it wasn't just with the, the, the way you planted, it was how you worked with the landscape to diversify your planting skills. Like over here, you plant different than over there. You, you use all of it to help you weave this amazing, um, sustainable lifestyle together. And that's what we're about. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'd like to, uh, oh, okay, yeah. <laughs>